So I'm going to quickly um, introduce our uh, facilitators for the day. Um, they are uh, Tommy Noonan. Uh, Tommy is a director, a choreographer. Um, he is one part of Culture Mill in Saxbaha, North Carolina. And um, Tommy has um, worked all around the globe, um, but is from North Carolina originally. And uh, Culture Mill really, you know, works doing performance with, you know, ADF, with CPA, and they also work as a social justice laboratory. So thank you for being here, Tommy. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you. Thank you for being with us. And thank you to um, everyone, uh, Lauren and Savannah and Amanda and Faye for, for hosting this great project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit and then um, Tommy is going to do something with you and then I'm going to talk a longer bit and then and then we'll be done uh, before you uh, talk at us. Uh, so a starting point for talking about liveness and talking about liveness as a problem is talking about how you've been talking about liveness over the last few weeks. And we are starting talking about liveness at the end of your talking about liveness. A starting point for talking about liveness is that living or living is a process of habitualization. And the role of art is to defamiliarize the experience of the world, to make the stone stony. Viktor Shlavsky said that, not me, and now I said it. In making the familiar strange through theater is a political project in which we should find astonishing the violence and inequalities produced by capitalism when it is working as designed. Bertolt Brecht said that, and now I said it. A starting point for talking about liveness is in my first starring role in a play in my junior year in high school, our class one acts, where I interrupted the intermission to give my opening line is anyone here a virgin? That play was called Present Tense. A starting point for talking about liveness is 2016 when I stumbled into what I thought were two new research projects in performance, one on contemporary politically engaged art and the other on my dear friend and mentor, the postmodern choreographer and originator of the approach to performance called The Viewpoints, Mary Overly, who died this summer, which makes it strange to talk about liveness because she's dead. But as I delved into them, I realized these were not new practices, but were long running obsessions in how I think about performance and what my investment of performance was, which had little to do with pretending to be other people in a play or even conveying a story, but it was the charged and immediate moment, the heightened occasion when one person does something in front of another group of people who is there to watch. I call this the drama of the actual. We can call this experience liveness, but I like thinking about it as a friction between two forms of experience, the prepared, structured, scripted, audience-aware, underlined artifice fiction form, and the naturally unfolding, impromptu, improvisatory, doing, being, sincere, authentic, actual, also known as reality or reality. So we could say these two forms of experience are frames of experience and that they're always in some kind of relationship 
in performance, we just aren't always noticing it. But we notice it when something goes wrong. Like when the eight-year-old actor in a grade school play playing Abraham Lincoln forgets their lines, pees their pants, and starts crying. Uh, a starting point for talking about liveness is to show you Mary's dance of the hand, which she would often do and did when she was in Chapel Hill three and a half years ago when we could be alive together in the same room, you and I, and she and I. She would hold out her hand and say, this is shape. This is time. This is story. Any moment, this is going to become art. And so a starting point for talking about liveness is to talk about what Tommy and I have been talking about frames and framing and time and failure. A starting point for talking about liveness might be to say that liveness is an experience or a kind of experience or something that can only be experienced. What we will try to do is frame liveness because liveness is happening now. And now. And now you are breathing and I am breathing. You are there and I am here. You are seeing me or bits of colored light that represent me. And you're seeing me in many frames, a zoom window on a, rectangu on a rectangular screen. And to frame what's next, I'll kick it to Tommy. He will be live, and so will you. Thanks, Tony. Hello. Yeah, let's just start where we are right now, because everybody has a body. So just feel that you have a weight, you have a mass in space. Someone named this mass. Your name is also a name for this mass. So feel your weight right now, wherever you are. And what I'm going to do is going to lead through an embodied process, an embodied practice. It's a way of sharing with you over the next 20 or so minutes, um, my artistic practice also that you can experience some part of it and not just hear about it. Um, so feel the feeling of your weight. And I'd like to invite all of us from where we are, if we feel able to just please stand if you can. And if you cannot stand, you're welcome to sit. But if you are able to stand, I would like to ask you to stand. To move away from the zone of the screen the zone of the chair, and to actually feel what it feels like to have your feet on the floor as I'm speaking, and to participate in this experience and feel it in your body. So as you stand or you sit and you're feeling the feeling of your feet against the floor, your weight dropping down, I also just want to acknowledge as well that this practice is something that is also part of a perspective of my partner and work, Muriel Lision, right? And to acknowledge the fact that this particular Zoom session is led by two white cis men. And so there are so many perspectives that are also not given in this particular Zoom call. And one in particular is Muriel's, which informs this process that I'm going to be leading through. So I just want that to be named. And 
as we feel our bodies, go ahead and lose yourself into looking at the screen. We look at me, we look at each other, right? We look, at, we look into the screen, we kind of lose ourselves like, ah, right there. There goes our sense, of, our sense of place into another place, a place that's shared by all these people. And now take your vision away from the screen and just see the room you're actually standing in and feel in your body when your awareness returns to this place, the place that your body is in. And move it back to the screen and feel yourself transported again away, right? To all these faces, all these places, all these other rooms, and then allow it to drift back into the place that you're in, right? Feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your body in the space, feeling the sense of your weight dropping, even giving a small massage to the floor with your feet, going ahead and articulating your toes, your ankles, the balls of your feet, all of that around. And don't feel tethered to the screen as a place to look. You can look to the screen, you can look around, out of the screen, you can feel your feet on the floor. And as we started this class, I began to look into definitions of live, the word live. Right from everywhere, from the Oxford English Dictionary to, you know, whatever, crazy bills, houseofwords.com. And I came up with a number of different definitions, right? Live, at the site of an actual event or performance. So it's concerned in that definition with place, right? So where are you right now in place? How does your body feel in place? You can keep massaging the floor with your feet. I also came across the definition transmitted at the time of an occurrence. So another definition of live is time, right? And if you're not standing, feel your sits bones on the chair. Feel your sits bones on the chair or couch in which you're sitting and feel that chair supporting you and move around in it. Feel the surfaces that you're in contact with. Brian Masumi, who's a philosopher, talks about how the skin thinks faster than the analytical or verbal mind, right? Our skin, our largest sensory organ has a sense of knowing of processing information, which in terms of affect is faster than the mind. So how can we know a sense of liveness through our skin and our bodies, not just through a conceptual verbal experience? Keep feeling the floor with your feet. Keep feeling the surfaces that might be touching and supporting your body. Keep seeing the room around you traveling in space, elsewhere on the Zoom call and back to the room that you're in. Another definition is not yet used of con or containing undetonated explosives, live. Another definition is connected to a source of electric current, live. And live, which came from the word alive in Elizabethan English, right? Alive, there's over a hundred definitions of what it means for something to be alive. And scientists don't even agree on what is alive and what is not alive, because another definition is not dead, right? Not inanimate. So a virus is arguably alive or not alive, right? It comes in contact with a cell and then it becomes active. It itself doesn't have cells or metabolism, so it's not alive but also it has DNA, genetic coding, right? It can evolve. So look at your hands as you feel your feet on the floor and notice the layers of skin and bones, right? Of muscle tissue, these hands that have been with you your entire life. Going ahead and closing your eyes Closing your eyes and feeling the feeling on your skin of air, of texture, of the room around you. Hearing sounds of my voice, but also sounds that are in the room. And placing your hand over your heart and just feeling the beating of your heart there in space. And knowing too that the body has a different sense of time, right? What is the time that it takes to come into your body? Noticing right now, 
what might be different in this moment than was earlier in our Zoom call. Releasing your hand from your heart. When I ask to open our eyes in a few moments, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open our eyes with a soft gaze, a non-judgmental gaze, one that takes in the room around us. So go ahead and open your eyes and just allow information to come in. Not in terms of what objects are, but in terms of form, shape, color, distance. You can keep moving in space. You can keep a bit of your attention on your body, but also be receiving information. Angles, distances, the play of light and shadow. So as we see what's around us, we just take in this information, right? This now-ness of the room, the room at this exact moment. And Tony and I have been talking a lot about liveness as something which cannot be pinned down, just like there's no singular definition in the dictionary, right? Or a dictionary of one thing that it means. Also, we feel that perhaps maybe it is a subjective experience, right? It is a matter of intensities, of perception, right? What is more or less live and why? And so as we look around this room and we're noticing and we're taking in information, we're going to believe for a second that this room around us, your room that you're standing in, continue to look at it, continue to feel your body in space. It is an art exhibit, right? It is an exhibit which was created by an artist exactly as it is. So noticing everything in your room, every book, the way it's leaning, every piece of paper, every light, every bit of dust, that was a choice. So we're going to believe that this, this room around us was all a choice. It was all a choice created by some artists and we are experiencing it. Right? Perhaps we're experiencing it in this moment live, even though the room may be static in time, we encounter it in this moment in time. And because we are noticing in a certain way, is there a quality of liveness? Can we generate an experience of liveness just within ourselves and our perceptions and our state of being? without it being dependent on the thing, can it be generated in us? Continue looking around. And allow your gaze and your vision to fall onto just one object somewhere in your room. Just noticing what that object is. Seeing it, seeing its form, its shape, its texture. And just going over to it and picking it up. Going ahead and picking up that object and feeling what it feels like in your hands, right? Its form, its shape, its texture, its weight. Feeling it in different ways. Noticing how it is in your body. Coming back to a place with a bit of space in your room and just placing it. Placing that object down. Nice. After you place it, letting your gaze move to another place in the room, another object, something else. And going over to that object, picking it up, feeling also its weight, its texture, its contours. And then walking back over and placing that second object on top of the first in the best way that you can, carefully on top of the first. After you're doing that, finding a third object in the room, going over to it, 
picking it up and feeling its qualities. Right. And then walking back, being aware of your body, placing it on top of the first two objects. Nice. Not being too precious, but just doing the best you can. Seeing another object in the room, going to it, picking it up, feeling its different elements, its different qualities coming back and placing it, balancing it as best you can on top of what is already there. We're gonna continue this process being aware of what's going on in our bodies, as well as our minds. Finding different objects in our room and each time bringing them back and placing them on top of what is already there. Continuing doing the best you can. Noticing what is happening for you in your room, inside of you. Always one more object. And considering how do you feel in your body as this is happening? What do you expect will happen? Will you succeed? Will you fail? How long will this exercise continue? Please do continue. Do you feel frustrated, anxious, inspired, alive? Are you hoping for the best? Are you expecting the worst? If failure happens, do you reconfigure? Do you try again? Do you give up? <laughs> what does this frame's task produce in you? What does it create on the spectrum of liveness? Is liveness increasing? Is it decreasing? Continue just another minute. I've now given a frame of time. What does that do in you now that you know that we're only continuing for another minute? Are you really trying your best? Are you phoning it in? Does it matter? So wherever you are in this process, go ahead and let it go. Drop what you're doing. Close your eyes and place your hand on your heart. Feel your heart beating. When I was a child, my grandfather died of a heart attack and I was terrified when I was told his heart just stopped beating. Because
because I had no idea when mine would stop or why. And I knew it was this thing that just continued to keep me alive. But I didn't know for how long. And so just feeling that your heart is still beating and you are here. So thank you, Tommy, for posing liveness as a peculiar detonation and feeling the feeling and noticing in a certain way, which is also what is the viewpoint. And I want to think about this question of the liveness spectrum and as if we could be more or less live. What you're seeing now is a video recording of John, a performance choreographed and danced by Tommy Noonan, American Dance Festival in Durham, North Carolina on June 19, 2017, which was my son Carlos third birthday. I never saw this performance. I was in Berlin. I saw him perform a work called John in Durham during the waning weeks before the 2016 election. This section that you're watching begins at 31.01 and goes until 50 minutes, at which point I will stop talking. I don't remember if Mary really ever used the word liveness when she talked about performance or when she taught the viewpoint and approach to theater and dance. She originated in the 1970s and developed because she died in June. Forged in the vibrant interdisciplinary art scene of you know, downtown New York City district of Soho, Mary didn't seek to create a technique or method, but simply wanted to understand what the materials of performance were. And very early on, she identified these six materials as space, shape, time, motion, movement, and story. These were materials. They were languages being spoken on stage before the performer arrived. In Mary's approach, the performer is invited not to create, but to become observer participates with those materials. You would say, listen to the materials. They are smarter than you and have better ideas. The viewpoints is Mary's approach to performance. That is, it is a name for how the performer approaches the materials and the act of performance. At the particle level, inventing the wheel backwards, as she would say, but you would come to discover the thing by taking it apart. And the horizontal, the idea that any and every material on stage is of equal importance, including the performer and the audience and that form and meaning emerge through assemblage rather than intended meaning. These six viewpoints of space, the geographic relationship between 
things, and including people, Tommy and the microphone stand and the screen, the position of the lighting banks on the floor, the black partitions on the stage, shape the exterior form of everything, including a body. Time, tempo, the rate of speed, duration, how long something goes on for, nowness, againness, the singularity of a particular kind of temporal experience. What is the time? What is fluorescent light time? What is reading your email, going to the bathroom time. They each have a particular quality of experience. Emotion for Mary was really another name for presence. The dynamic fact of one person on stage with another set of people watching. He called it the dog sniff dog world of being open and sniffable to those watching. Movement, not the fact of moving, but the kinesthetics of locomotion and or illness. And these shape and move and adapt as Tommy extends the duration of this performance over and over and over again. And last is story. But for Mary, story didn't mean the construction of a, a, a fictional narrative or even a non-fictional uh, linear story in that sense. She used it as a, a word for logic or structure and that meaning that emerges in any performance work meaning emerges inevitably because of one thing after another or two things in a shared space these six materials of space shape time emotion movement and story when Mary performed, when she created work, they were always in theaters or performance spaces or galleries or lofts. And they were always in demarcated and bounded spaces that occurred within specific time. They were framed as performance. And yet materials, as the word Mary used, is not incidental. She was interested in these as an in their materiality, the thingliness of them. They are the actual stuff of performance that we can experience as such. And in this performance by Tommy, one such uh, material is the t material of time and of duration that Tommy doesn't need to construct that as a meaningful act. It just happens and he inhabit it, inhabits it and calls our attention to its presence, not his brilliant idea, though that is also there. And to Lauren's question, I can't believe I'm multitasking, that repetition uh, is that, and how that emerges and evolves over time is part of what Mary means by the viewpoint of movement. The, the kinesthetic quality of how Tommy inhabits the exact same choreography shifts to a different quality of exhaustion shaped by um, uh, by, by the physically overtasked body. 
And so that connects us to the read some of the readings, which hopefully some of you had a chance to look at. And if one way to think about Tommy performing John or Tommy having performed John or us watching now a video of a performance that happened where Tommy performed John can connect us to Gertrude Stein's thinking about time and of composition. And time, I just want to mark these two figures of time that she presents. One is beginning again, and the other is the continuous present. This piece by Tommy, and this section of this piece specifically, is a continual beginning again. It's a beginning again, and it's beginning again, and again, and again. And the longer he performs it, the more we have that sense of him having to start again. And the, and the newness that occurs in the againness. The continuous present, on the other hand, for Gertrude Stein, is an ongoing and fluid relationship to time where things are always constantly existing together. She says, continuous presence is one thing and beginning again is another thing. They are both things. And then there is using everything. And composition is the other term I wanted to refer to. He says many times in many more or less, and sometimes identical formulations. Everything is the same except composition and time. Composition and the time of the composition and the time in the composition. Everything is the same except composition and of time. It is the composing of elements and that constructs difference. And it is that difference and the difference over time that comes to give a sense of form. Composition is not here, it's there. It's going to be there and we are here. And she says one thing that maybe we can come back to later is that time in the composition comes now, and that is what is now troubling. For Adrian Piper and Claudia Rankin, it is the experience of a moment, an order of time in which, for example, in Claudia Rankin's writing on Serena Williams, it's the ways in which race constantly produces unlivable moments that are heightened occasions of the now precisely because of the experience of them as repetitions of that which continually repeats. Adrian Piper, the, the artist, wants to work that condition in different ways. In her work from the 1970s, he wants to unsettle our uh, easy ability to categorize that which we perceive, including race and gender, by creating works that catalyze viewers so that they can't categorize what it is that they're seeing, preserving the impact and uncategorized nature of the confrontation. And in the calling card pieces from the 1980s, she does the double-sided work of staging the actual as a real thing, but also 
specifically by turning it into a conceptual art piece in the performative act. Yvonne Rayner says that dance is hard to see, but that repetition over time and bodies doing the same movement simultaneously makes it easier to see. The accumulation of movement makes the dance more clear, says Lauren. And this is what Yvonne Rayner refers to as her audience problem. The challenge of being before others and for others without falling into seducing them into um, that kind of uh, manipulating control of attention. And she said, by God, is that what theater all comes down to one group of people sitting and watching another group of people. So as we watch and we watch Savannah put the cursor back over the video to see if we reached the moment of 50 minutes into the beginning of when this was recorded. The different tracks of time we experience simultaneously of that which happened before, that which is streaming now, and our, our awareness of Savannah cursoring over that marks the time of the recording that we know that we are not supposed to attend to as the extraneous element of the work. Can we think of that moment as the one in which we experience time and as liveness. I want us to think about liveness as something we can't not do or can't not inhabit. And to think about this Zoom time as, and, and, and as the monstrosity that it is, as its own particular experience of liveness. It's not one involved with interacting with digital pixelated images of other people, though that is also what we do with our eyes. 